Please join me in welcoming Carol Off. Cough candy, just gonna put that there. Remind me that's there, I might need that later. <laughs> Good evening. Um, it's lovely to see everybody here tonight. This is a packed room, isn't it? Wonderful. On January 25th, 2011, as I think everyone in this room knows, the world watched in fascination as Egypt erupted into its own revolution. And in our newsrooms, we had followed Arab Spring roll across the Middle East, and now it was in the heart of Cairo in Tahrir Square. Where I work at CBC, we had determined that, well, CBC Radio, we determined that we must cover this story from the point of view of Arabs, and in this case, Egyptians. And that might seem obvious, but there is a tendency in Western media to regard the Middle East and its events through the eyes of Washington and the Knesset. But this revolution was entirely about Arabs and Egyptians, not the United States or Israel. And this was about a people who had been under colonialism and dictatorship for a very long time, and they were shaking it off. And we had to get it right. I'm not sure we could have done that if not for the extraordinary Egyptians who so eloquently and so generously explained their story. We were blessed at CBC Radio, as it happens to have Egyptian-Canadian Pesent Matar, who's here tonight. From the moment Tahrir Square erupted, every second of that revolution was reflected in her face and her whole demeanor. And through Pesent, I understood what it meant to young Egyptians and in particular to Egyptian women. She found for us the people we needed to speak to tell the story every Egyptian was living so intensely. It was Pesent who first told us about Mona El Tahawi. And tonight it is my great privilege to meet Mona we will have an on-stage interview that will be played in part on CBC as it happens. And this is also an evening where Mona will answer your questions. But first she's going to come up stage and read from her book. And for anyone who doesn't know about this extraordinary woman, allow me to say a few words of introduction. Mona El Tahawi is a very influential journalist, feminist, essayist, and revolutionary. She has won numerous awards for her writing in Arabic and English-speaking publications. She has a presence throughout TV and radio around the world that people listen to, respond to, learn from, challenge and disagree with, but pay attention to. She is more than a writer and thinker. She has been on the ground in that revolution, and she has paid a great personal price for her engagement as she's exposed her most vulnerable moments to us in order to shed some light in some very dark places. Mona has launched a very important and groundbreaking conversation with her essays, put together in this powerful and provocative book, Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. Please give a warm welcome to Mona El Tahawi. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It really warms my heart to see so many people here. And I want to thank the Toronto Public Library and Kuchiching. Well, I, I always get their name wrong, but they know I mean well. And I spoke at one of their conferences in 2011, so I have many dear friends from there as well. And um, to open up tonight, I'm going to read you two brief passages from my book. But before I do, I want to place the book in what I call um, a moment I believe that we're going through right now of global feminism. Many of you have been following the incredible women from India who have been speaking out after the Delhi gang rape. Many of you might know that the hashtag Black Lives Matter movement in the United States was started by women, and we're seeing the importance of that movement every day. As we're meeting here today, there are protests in Baltimore to, um, against, or to, to demonstrators are on the streets to protest another police killing of a black man in the United States. Um, you've probably heard of uh, the lynching of a woman in Afghanistan a few weeks ago called Farhunda, 
and how Afghan women there broke tradition and insisted on burying her themselves. And even before that, you might have heard of Turkish women who, after a woman was raped and murdered, insisted that they too would bury her because they would not let another man touch her. And according to conservative Islamic burial traditions, women don't take part in the actual burial. So for women to do that, as I said, it's again this global moment of feminism where we're recognizing each other's work. And one of the things that I try to do in my book, and I, I stress again and again, is that misogyny does not exist in just one part of the world. No area has completely erased misogyny. It lies on a spectrum or a continuum, but some countries have managed to move along further. And what I believe we're doing in the Middle East and North Africa now, and what I, what I believe we need to do even harder, is to push our region further along that continuum through a consistent and enraged feminist movement that fights against that misogyny because I believe that political revolution that we began will fail unless we have a social and sexual revolution that takes the revolution home and that holds the state, the street, and the home accountable in the way that we held our dictator and we continue to hold our dictators, including Sisi in Egypt today, accountable. Thank you. This is from a chapter called The God of Virginity. Our hymens are not ours. They belong to our families. This truth was brought home to me one evening in Amsterdam after I'd taken part in an event on the rights of Muslim women. In a conversation that evening, probably the first about sex I had had with fellow Arab or Muslim women, a Dutch Moroccan woman told me and a group of her friends, when I first had sex, it was as if my mother, my father, my grandparents, the entire neighborhood, God and all the angels were there watching. We all convulsed with laughter. It was a relief to talk to women who still understood the, burgeon, the burden of virginity and the guilt involved in shedding it, women who did not judge. It was a relief to talk to women who would never ask, how could you not resist? As the nurse in the ER asked me when I told her I'd been sexually assaulted. I actually resisted for a long time, too long, I believe, when I look back now. I guarded my hymen like a good virgin until I was 29. I accepted and obeyed what I was taught by my family, who in turn were taught by their parents no sex until marriage. Now when I think, now when I think about how long I waited to have sex, I am sad for my younger self and sad that I waited so long to experience and enjoy something that gives me so much pleasure. Back then, though, during all those years that I waited and waited, it would terrify me even to consider sex before marriage. I was taught by my family, by school, by religion, by society, and I obeyed. I'd been trained well, and I was a good girl to the end. My hymen was protected from my feminism. My feminism wrestled with my headscarf, but not with my hymen. Why? Why did I obey, and why did I wait so long to finally disobey? Those questions kept coming up again and again in, of all places, Oklahoma. There, in a University of Oklahoma lecture room, where I was teaching a course on gender and new media in the Middle East in 2010, I began publicly to share my reckoning with the god of virginity. How do you discuss virginity with a class of American university students without the conversation sounding irrelevant to their lives, or worse, like an exercise in exoticizing another culture? Women, sex, and culture form a Bermuda Triangle in which open discussion tends to run off course through either defensiveness, when students feel compelled to defend a cultural practice, or superiority, when they feel compelled to parade their culture as being above cultural challenges that are being discussed. The personal is not only political, it demolishes this Bermuda Triangle. I received a powerful reminder about how much easier the personal makes, makes it to discuss problems over there after I showed my class the Lebanese film Caramel, in which director Nadine Labaki plays the owner of a Beirut hair salon whose friends and co-workers co portray a cross-section of the Lebanese female experience. One of the friends in the film undergoes hymen reconstruction just before her wedding to a man she, feel, she fears will reject her if he finds out she isn't a virgin. At first, some students express shock that the woman could not share her sexual history with her future husband, while others wondered why it was such a big deal that she was no longer a virgin. I reminded the class that until the 1960s, virginity was a big deal in the United States too. Have you heard of purity balls? 
asked one young woman in the class, referring to formal dances in the US between fathers and daughters at which teenage girls pledged to remain virgins until marriage. Such balls underpin purity culture in the United States. Yes, I thought, now virginity was over here. I had indeed heard of purity balls through news articles, but they seemed as foreign to me and to the class as hymen reconstruction, until the personal shook us out of our complacency. I just want everyone to know that I signed a purity pledge with my father, one of the students said. I could not have engineered it better myself. Her courage and sharing reminded us all that virginity wasn't just far away in Lebanon or in newspaper feature stories, it was right in class with us. Oklahoma kept doing that to me. I joked that going there was like going to the Middle East. A similar mix of religion and conservative politics prevailed. Watching the way the US religious right wing has managed to erode women's reproductive rights, especially in the South, I was struck by how important and courageous feminist and reproductive rights activists in those southern states are. Some of the other students tiptoed around asking questions of the student who had shared her purity pledge experience. I respect that you think you've made a free choice, one student told her, but the American playwright Eve Ensler said that when you sign a pledge to your father, your sexuality is being taken away from you until you sign it to your husband when you get married. Teaching is like alchemy. You take a few students, mix in some difficult subjects, and you are bound to be stunned by the results. I make my classes as personal as possible. I offer my experiences to keep a face on the issues we're talking about. So the least I could do to show my appreciation for the generous sharing we had all witnessed and to express solidarity with a conservative position I once shared was to tell the class how long I had waited to have sex. There were no purity pledges in my past, but there was a time when I too believed I should wait till I get married before I had sex. But then it took forever to get married and I got fed up waiting. <laughs> Shall I read one more short passage? This one is more specifically about Egypt. On March 8, 2011, there was a small but determined protest demanding that Egyptian women have a voice in building the country's future, including the right to be president. Despite or perhaps precisely because of their active role in the revolution, the 200 women who formed the protest, together with some male supporters, were optimistic. But they were met with opposition from men in Tahrir Square, according to the Christian Science Monitor, and were set upon by men from outside the square who yelled at and in some cases groped and sexually assaulted several of the women and a few of the, men, the male protesters. Go home, go wash clothes, yelled some of the men. You're not married, go find a husband. The next day, March 9th, 2011, soldiers cleared Tahrir Square of those who had returned to protest the slow pace of change under the military junta that had taken over after Mubarak's ouster. The military arrested hundreds of demonstrators and threw them in military jails, where many were tortured and beaten. According to human rights groups, 17 female demonstrators were beaten, prodded with electric shock batons, subjected to strip searches, forced to submit to so-called virginity tests, and threatened with prostitution charges. Less than a month after Mubarak had stepped down, the military junta that replaced him, ostensibly to protect the revolution, had officers stick their fingers into the vaginal openings of female revolutionaries, women who should have been our heroes, ostensibly in search of a hymen, ostensibly to protect the military from accusations of rape by the detainees because only virgins can be raped, of course. In other words, the Egyptian military sexually assaulted Egyptian women so that they could not falsely accuse the officers of sexual assault. Samira Ibrahim, one of the women subjected to sexual assault, sued, but a military court exonerated a military doctor she had accused of conducting the tests, despite the admission by several members of the ruling military junta, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, that the tests took place, and included among the, the, that Supreme Military of the Armed, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, who admitted we had had these so-called virginity tests, is our current president in Egypt, Abdel Fattah Sisi, who at the time was head of military intelligence. It should have been our moment of reckoning. It should have sparked another revolution, yet nothing happened. In fact, Salwa al Husseini, the first woman to reveal the so-called virginity tests, was called a liar and vilified for trying to turn the people against the mantra, the army and the people are one hand, which was popular when the military seemed to be siding with the people in the final days of Mubarak's decline. 
Perhaps, though, the army and the people on one hand was one of the most honest statements to come out of our revolution. One hand united and working against women, one hand that groped or beat women and tried to terrorize them out of public space, one hand that found it perfectly acceptable to force two fingers into a woman's vagina. Those women had risked their lives to liberate Egypt, and yet their violation was met with silence. That silence points to a truth. The regime oppressed everybody, but society particularly oppresses women. The regime knows it can violate women because society objects women to the same violations. It knows that society will not speak out for its own women. In return for unaccountability for its oppressions, the regime turns a blind eye to society's abuses, tacitly condoning harassment and assault. Thank you. Monel Tehawe, it is a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much. We followed what you did, what you and the others did in Tahrir Square. The, it was extraordinary to watch that revolution, and in particular, it was extraordinary to watch the women and to see their strength and their courage and, uh, and to see how the men protected them in many cases, as well as the incidents that I want to talk to you tonight about. One of the things that you said in the book, quite late in the book, you said that when you, when you returned to Egypt for the revolution, you said, I wanted to inhale Egyptian men. There is no other way to describe it. Why did it have that effect on you? I think if you talk to any Egyptian, especially those of us who support the revolution, they will tell you it's a moment we had been waiting for all our lives, all our lives. I mean, my family left Egypt when I was seven, and I returned when I was 21, and I remember when I returned, the shock of the poverty, the shock of the human rights violations, continual shocks, I was constantly asking my uncles and aunts who I lived with, where's the revolution, where's the revolution? So this was something we had all been waiting for all our lives. And for me, a part of that revolution was our need an absolute necessity of reconciling as the genders, because I, I believe that that trifecta of the state, the street, and the home, and the misogyny and the patriarchy that they all share in common has, has created this awful distrust between men and women that has really ruined our ability to relate either emotionally or sexually as free and dignified beings, which is one of the chants of the revolution. That this, this was all about a revolution of freedom and dignity. So when I went back to Egypt, I thought, you know, this is a moment where I could find all these men who, for the longest time, I thought I would never find, which were men who, were, who, who demanded freedom and who demanded dignity and who understood equality for everybody. But I think one of the things that, that I, I constantly had to relearn was something that I quote in the book that was said by a Spanish anarchist during the Spanish Civil War. I'm particularly obsessed with Spain um, especially Catalonia, when the anarchists ran it before everything went to shit. And um, but one of the anarchist women there said, the compañeros outside of the home, you know, during union meetings and during protests and stuff, you know, they act like we are equal, equals in the revolution. But when we go home, they remove the revolution as if they're removing a costume. And they treat the women that they were marching with and that they were being, you know, true and noble anarchists with, just like ordinary wives. So I think that this was the challenge for me, to find Egyptian, revolutionary Egyptian men who wanted to break that trifecta. But you, it also, because you, and you mentioned it, is that you, that you, you were a virgin until you were 29, and um, your sexual awakening was an extremely important part mm -hmm. of that return, that revolution. Mm -hmm. But also, you said that this, you, you had to think long and hard about to, including that in this book to actually, I mean, all the things you described, the, the, the frightening, uh, horrible things that happened to you, all the, the thing that you were most nervous about was having your parents read about the fact that you were having sex. So, <laughs> You know, why was that, the, the, maybe just talk a bit about that being, just exposing yourself in that way and why you felt it was necessary to let the world know what you had gone through in order to arrive at the place of being a sexual being. Right, well, you know, when, whenever we had protests in Cairo, I, I would never go on social media and tell people, come to the street, because this, this is not a risk that I could take for anybody. 
this is a risk, and especially after what happened to me and so many other people, because as many of you probably know, the riot police beat me and broke my left arm and my right hand, and I was sexually assaulted and detained for 12 hours. So I could never take the responsibility of, of someone else's safety and say, go to the streets. I would say I am going to protest. And so the least I could do in writing a book about the social and sexual revolution was to you know, incite women to rise up against this trifecta of the state the street and the home without sharing my own personal revolution. And for me, my own personal revolution took place over many years. It was much easier for me as a younger woman to stand up to the Mubarak regime, to expose the Mubarak regime's human rights violations, to be taken to state security and threatened with, with imprisonment if I didn't reveal a source. All that I could do, you know, and I wouldn't miss a beat. But to talk about sex, to think about having sex outside of marriage, that was just almost impossible for me. And so when I finally did have sex, it, was, it wasn't something, as I mentioned in my reading, I could share with anybody. But now, you know, to, to talk about how we need to break uh, apart, to break free and, and to, to destroy this trifecta of the state street and, and the home when it comes to patriarchy and misogyny, I cannot tell women to go do this without sharing how I, how I did it. So, of course, you know, I, I wondered how my family would feel about it. And just before I went on book tour, I, I, I go and spend... My family and I are now at this wonderful impasse where we don't have to fight about everything. And I go and spend two days a week with my parents in Cairo. I live alone, but I spend two days a week with them. And during one of those days, my sister comes with her husband for a family dinner. So I sat them down on, on my last family dinner before book tour, and I said, look, I, we have to talk about my book. <laughs> and they were like, oh, boy. <laughs> And my mother said, well, your title's enough. I mean, like, I don't know what to expect. <laughs> and so I said to them, I said, listen, I love you. I really love you. And my mother's like, oh, my God, what's going to come up in this book? I said, I did not write this book to hurt your feelings. I wrote this book because this is my revolution. And I, and I had to share the things that I had to share because it really is my revolution. But there are things you won't like. And so either don't read the book or just kind of skip chapter six because it's, it's a bit difficult. And my mother goes, I'm reading every single word of this book because I need to see what my crazy daughter has done. So that's my mother's reaction. And my dad, my dad said, we love you. We're very proud of you. We're very proud of your courage. We might disagree with you, but you must know that we love you and we're proud of you. So I left Egypt with, with that note. What they're going to say after they read the book, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the, the title of the book, Headscarves and Hymens, okay, provocative. I think any mother would say, okay, I wonder where my daughter is going with this book. Hescars and Hymans, the subtitle is Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. Can you explain, I mean, because this, the, the, the revolution that you took part in was a social revolution. It was against the military dictatorship. It was against colonialism. It was against so many things. Why do you think it's necessary that the Middle East has a sexual revolution? Right. Well, if, if I can reverse a bit and just talk about the title very quickly, because I think that maybe those who haven't read my book don't understand where I'm coming from with the title specifically. I, I believe that for too long, women in the Middle East and North Africa have just been reduced to what's on our head and what's in between our legs. So I wanted to break that paradigm to say that we are more than our headscarves and we are more than our hymens. And then the, the sexual revolution part, I mean, I twin it with the social revolution. But I especially wanted to, to focus on the, the sexual aspects for, for probably two reasons. I think if, if you were to, to, to draw this line between all the countries that have either risen up or have been inspired, because I know that women in Saudi Arabia, women in Jordan, women in Morocco, who perhaps didn't have their own revolutions but have had their own protests or own kind of um, enlightenment just through watching the, the various revolutions and uprisings, what they, what they all experience are essentially revolutions about consent and agency. And I think this, this is what lies at the heart of the various revolutions. And that obviously lies at the heart of sex and a woman's ability to both claim it and enjoy it without the guilt and without feeling trapped between a headscarf and a hymen, what's on our head, what's in between our legs. And also, if I were to draw a line between one of the earliest crimes that are committed against the body of the female in the region, that would be female genital mutilation or cutting in you know, my country of birth. 91% of girls and women between the age of 15 to 49, 91% have been cut unnecessarily, all for the sake of controlling their sexuality. So I'm thinking of one of the earliest, in the terms of age, crimes against women that are committed to things like driving and mobility and freedom in Saudi. And again, they're connected with these ideas of consent and agency. And I, I think finally also, 
um, I mentioned the names of many feminists in the region that I think a lot of people outside the region don't know about, that we've had this long um, or a feminist movement from the 1920s. And sadly, many people in the region don't know some of these names as well. But another thing that, I, that I, I've known for a while but was happier to, to look into more is that this idea of women and sex and desire has always existed in my, in my heritage. It's not something that I need to import. And there's a book that, that I quote in, uh, in, in my book called Classical Poems of Arab Women that are basically Arab poems from the 10th and the 11th century translated into English in which Arab women very openly uh, talk about desire and, and claim their sexuality. So one of the questions I ask in the book is, why have we lost that? What has happened between the 10th century to now? And what can we do to reclaim it? And one of the things that I try to do, beyond just talking about the sexual violence that I experienced and survived, is to move beyond that to talk about sex and desire. Because once we start talking about girls and women having a right to our body, and agency and consent, and women, adults, consenting adults having the right to sex and pleasure, then we can start to unpack and destroy this idea that it's okay to mutilate a girl for the sake of controlling her sexuality. So that's why I focus on the sex. The <clears throat> thing is though that your country, Egypt, has a poverty rate, women's poverty rate of about 70%. It has an illiteracy rate mm -hmm. of about 70%. Women are struggling with so many issues. Mm -hmm. Do they need a sexual revolution or do they need feminists like yourself, strong women, educated women like yourself, to be fighting for their rights, their economic and their, and their legal rights, mm -hmm. not their sexual rights? Do they really need us? Is that really the most important thing that, that women need to have right now in Egypt? Or mm -hmm. are they missing so many other key components mm -hmm. of, of a fair and balanced life? Right. Well, the sexual revolution is in the title of my book, but the actual content of the book looks at all those issues that you talk about. Because in the book, I discuss the state, the streets, and the home. And so I talk about the legal discrimination that women in the region face. I talk about the difficulties, of, um, the difficulties faced by women and girls under family law, which discriminates against girls and women across the region for both Muslim and Christian women. I talk about how difficult it is to live as an independent woman if you come from a disadvantaged background and how so, so many women, it's not even a choice when it comes to marriage or having children, it's just because that's the way you survive. I can choose to not be married because I'm lucky enough to have an education and I, I make money, but for many young women in the Middle East and North Africa, that is not a choice. Marriage is something that they, 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 they go into knowing it's their only way to survive. So no, clearly, it's much more than just sex, but, the, but sex is a part of it, and, it, and what I, the, the way I see what we need as women in the region is together the social and the sexual revolution. And even if you just look at this, the sexual revolution, I mean, again, as I said, at the heart of it is consent and agency, and that solves all the other problems you're talking about, because if I'm talking about women need to be married so that they could survive, I mean, there's very little consent and agency there. Women end up replicating the cycle of female genital cutting on their daughters, not because they hate them, but because they love them, but they under and they understand in order for their girls to survive in our society and be marriageable, they must go through this horrific pain that they went through. So, you know, we need to fight FGM, we need to fight female unemployment, we need to fight against women's ability to say, as an adult, I deserve to have sexual pleasure. Because one of the, one of the doctors that I quote in my book is an OBGYN friend of mine. Who, whose patients are mostly married women, and she sees patients in the morning at Cairo University Hospital who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, and she sees patients in the evening from a more affluent background. And across the board, all her patients complain of a, a lack of sexual pleasure, a lack of understanding of the sexual relationship between them and their husbands, and of the trauma and after effects of genital cutting. So, you know, whether, it's your, whether you're from an advantage, uh, affluent background or disadvantaged background, talking about sex is not a luxury. It touches, or at the heart of it, is exactly those issues that we need to talk about in order to increase women's economic opportunities, political freedom, because it's about consent and agency. And what about access to birth control? What about the access to being able to plan your family? Because this has been a key issue that's come up in Canada quite a bit because we've had a new women's health agenda, mm -hmm. which would not, our government would not include yes. reproductive rights in that. Mm -hmm. How integral is the, is the fight for reproductive rights? Mm -hmm. If those women are going to enjoy sex or just endure it, whatever mm -hmm. role they end up playing in that, 
Do they not have to have as a cornerstone the ability to control the spacing, the number of their children? Absolutely. And, and, and for now, in many parts of the Middle East and North Africa, contraception is usually available for married women. Because, but, you know, again, that beca it becomes a political issue. Because in Egypt, when the regime decided that it, it, the population was growing too fast, it got in Al-Azhar, which is the Sunni you know, bastion of learning in Egypt, and got the, the head of Al-Azhar, or the Grand Mufti of Egypt, to issue a fatwa to say that contraception was allowed in Islam. So clearly there's, again, the politicization of sex and the politicization of contraception. So yes, I, I agree with you. I think that adult women in the region, whether they're married or, not ma or unmarried, have the right to contraception, but it's not always, always available. And one of the other issues that I touch on in my book that we absolutely must discuss is sex outside of marriage, because it happens. And it happens often in secret, and it is a huge taboo, and it happens because the marriage age in the Middle East and North Africa, in many countries, is, has, has become much, much later. And so we have, our young people are having sex, but in very dangerous ways. And when sex is happening in the dark, and, and is a huge taboo, who ends up paying the highest price? It's the weakest members of any society, and those are girls and women. So whether it's, it's to do with child marriage, which happens in Egypt, in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, in Sudan, which should be banned, and unfortunately our clerics are too quiet about it, and our governments are too quiet about it, or when it, whether it's sex between consenting adults, it's something that we must talk about because it's happening. <clears throat> One of the, the first chapter of your book is also was an essay in Foreign Affairs. It's Foreign Policy. Foreign Policy, thank mm -hmm. you. It was also a, an essay in, in Foreign Policy magazine. The title is, Why They Hate Us. Can you explain in that title, Why They Hate Us, who is they and who is us? Right. Well, I took that title, Why Do They Hate Us, from, you, you might all remember Fareed Zakaria's essay for the cover of Time magazine after 9-11, where he made this argument that they out there who attacked us in the United States um, on 9-11 attacked us because they hate our freedoms. So I took that and I turned it upside down and I said that we have no freedom as girls and women in the Middle East and North Africa because they hate us. So, you know, clearly I was playing with words, but I, I think people took me really literally in that essay has, has, be, has exploded in, in terms of the discussions it, it has had. But, but you know, on, on a very fundamental level, I do believe there is a hatred for women in the region. But as I said before I, did my, my, before I read from my book, I believe misogyny, which is essentially hatred for women, exists everywhere. It's just either being masked or confronted in different parts of the world. And I'm talking about my part of the world because it's where I'm from. It's what shaped me. I mean, I'm Egyptian and I'm Muslim. And, and that culture of Egypt and, and my faith has made me the woman I am. And, and we have to name these things. In order to fight them, we have to name them. So, you know, I, and I wrote this essay. It was the first time I had used all 10 fingers after I removed the casts around my, my arms after I was beaten by the right police. And I was really angry, and I was in a lot of pain. And I just, I just wanted to cut to the chase. I, w I was like, excuse my language, fuck this shit. We have to talk about the reality, OK? Because we're going through revolutions. We are talking about women who risk their lives, as I said. And yet, when female revolutionaries are violated, nothing happens. When 15 schoolgirls in Saudi Arabia are burnt to death because the, right, the morality police won't let them out because they're not covered up, nothing happens. We should be building statues to these girls. They should be our revolutionary heroes. These women who are violated in Egypt should have a statue to honor them. That woman who's dragged through Tahrir Square after they stripped her down to her bra, stomped on her chest, we don't even know her name because her family has silenced her. So for how much longer are we going to put up with this so that we're not blaspheming or we're not being rude or we're not making our part of the world look bad. I reject respectable, respectability politics utterly. Nothing, no revolution succeeds by being nice and polite. I say fuck nice and polite. These are revolutionary times. I don't know if I can say fuck on the radio, so you might have to bleep me. You will be beeped. <laughs> You can say it, you'll just be beat. <laughs> you wrote, though, there's a quote I want to say that you mentioned that you said that the misogyny that you encountered, and, and clearly you give so many examples of it um, and make the good case for that, is it comes from a toxic mix of culture and religion. You said, and this is, I think, probably one of the lines you wrote when you took those casts off and you said, I'm going to say what I have to say. We Arab women live in a culture that is fundamentally hostile to us enforced by men's contempt. 
Yes, they hate us. It must be said. Do you think that Islam, do you think that your religion is at the root of that? I think my religion is used to justify that. You know, when people ask me, why are you still a Muslim and what does Islam mean to you and, and why is Islam still in your life? I often mention Khadija, and I mention her in the book as well, and Khadija was Muhammad's first wife. And she was a woman who was 15 years older than him, who employed him, who was a divorcee, and who proposed to him. He was 25 and she was 40. And I often joke I have a thing for younger men, so she's definitely a role model. But you know, we, we never talk about Khadija in this way. Khadija is a mother of the believers, and it, she's one of the women that we revere highly. And when I joke, I don't mean any offense. Obviously, I, I'm, I, I joke about this because I'm, I'm trying to connect it to a problem that we have in the region, which is that our clerics, and this is how they use Islam against us, our clerics, are, are apparently, according to them, to follow the example of the Prophet, and they claim that the Prophet was married to Aisha when she was nine, and some people say when she was 19. And so they will not take a strong stand against what I believe is pedophilia. In this day and age, if a man marries anyone who is under the age of marriage, he is guilty of the crime of pedophilia. I don't care what happened in the past, I'm talking about 2015. But our clerics, you know, they, they just kind of skirt around this issue and say, no, 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 we can't touch this, the prophet. And yet, our clerics never tell the millions of unemployed young men in the region Follow the sunnah of the prophet and marry an older woman. I've never heard this. I've never heard them say Khadija was 40 and Muhammad was 25 and she employed him. Go out there and marry an older woman because you will be revering the tradition of the prophet. And so this is how our religion is used against us. Why do the clerics get away with this? And why is this constantly used to justify a misogyny that, on, that ends up costing the lives of too many girls and women? But the same, the, the, the misogyny and the abuse is something that women suffer in many societies, in Christian societies, in yeah. Hindu societies. In fact, some of the worst examples of abuse of women and lack of women's rights is in sub-Saharan Africa, not in the Muslim communities entirely. Mm -hmm. It is something that is throughout, and at one time all societies treated women this way. Some have over uh, generations evolved, but it, as it's, what is the common denominator? Is it religion or is it, I would suggest, maybe a post-colonial patriarchy? I mean, it's, it's countries that were not allowed to give anyone rights because mm -hmm. it was too important to colonial powers to have those mm -hmm. controls. Mm -hmm. Is that not the common denominator among the, the countries and the regions that have not allowed women to develop rights? Mm -hmm. Well, I think your point about misogyny being global, I totally agree with, and that's, well, that's why I started my talk with this idea of this being a global feminist uh, moment. I lived in Jerusalem for almost 14 months as a Reuters correspondent, and many, of my, uh, the, many, many people in my neighborhood were ultra-Orthodox Jews, and the way that they lived their lives and the way the women were covered, you know, would, would wear a wig, and the way the man was always walking 10 steps ahead of a woman was as if I was in Saudi Arabia. So the ultra-Orthodox Jews, the Christians of the, the American South, I, in my talk, I, I mean, in my reading, I made it clear that in Oklahoma, I felt like I was in the Middle East. So the, the Christian right wing, who I call the Christian Brotherhood of the United States, <laughs> I fight them just as much as I fight the, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. So yeah, absolutely. It is. It's across religions, and I think that religion is too often used to silence women because, you know, you hit the stage where they say, this is what God said, and you either stay with it or leave it. And so, so I think it's a combination of that. It's a combination of various cultural practices that we as women had no role in determining that this is a culture. We did not choose this. Rather, these cultural practices are practiced upon our bodies, and that's female genital cutting and, and other things. And I think when people talk about, you know, undoubtedly, colonialism did great harm to the region. But colonization ended in the 1950s. What, what have our regimes done since then? So if, if colonization had ended 10 years ago, I would absolutely agree with you. But colonization in Egypt ended in 1952 when Gamal Abdel Nasser and a group of army officers kicked out the British and ended the monarchy. If our societies were truly concerned with creating societies of gender equality in which we had freedom and dignity, we would have used this opportunity from 1952 to now to lift up everyone in our society, but we haven't. And, and the clear kind of the, the line that connects everybody is this contempt for women. Now, the Nordic regions, they were not created feminists. Norway didn't, wasn't feminist from the beginning. They had to go through their own struggle. Denmark wasn't created feminist. But when you look at all these gender indices, many of which I quote in my book, 
Those countries consistently score at the top of the global gender index, and, and the Arabic-speaking countries of the Middle East and North Africa are even lower than sub-Saharan Africa when it comes to gender, the gender gap uh, indice, uh, index that is created by the World Bank. So clearly we're doing something very wrong when it comes to gender. Now, I do mention several examples of colonial laws that made it into our legal system, but unfortunately have, re have remained. So for example, countries that have laws that allow rapists to escape prosecution if they marry their victim, which is a horrifying thought. Morocco had this inserted in its legal system by the French when France occupied Morocco. But France got rid of this law a long time ago, and Morocco just got rid of it two years ago after two 16-year-old girls committed suicide after they were forced to marry their rapists. And Moroccan women went on the street and protested and managed to get this law repealed. In Jordan, this law still exists. So we can talk about you know, the, the sins of colonization, and they are many, but what have we done since we got rid of the European colonizers to make life in our countries better for women? The, the vicious attack that you suffered, that you write about in the book, that where you had your arm and your hand broken, and you were also sexually assaulted. Yes. You describe also one of the most horrible symbols of the revolution, a woman who's been reduced to three words, blue bra girl, mm -hmm. who was probably one of the most disturbing images mm -hmm. I will recall from this entire uh, revolution, a woman dragged through the street until her clothes ripped off, her mm -hmm. bra, very pretty bra, blue bra, mm -hmm. and yeah. a man jumping on her chest. Six officers jumping on her chest. But these, the, what happened to you and what happened to that woman and to other women was done by a secular state. Mm -hmm. It was done by secular yes. police. Yes, yes. Where is, what, what part of that then comes from culture and religion if it's a secular police who attacked you? Well, it comes from culture. And, and one of the points I make in my book and that I need to be very clear about, this isn't just about political Islam. This isn't just about the Muslim Brotherhood. This isn't just about the Salafi Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia or Daesh and ISIS or whatever you want to call them. This is about also so-called secular regimes who claim to be um, secular and ruling in a secular way and yet use religion to their political advantage and use religion as a way of opposing their political Islamic opponents. And so what ends up happening is, and if you look at, across the region, the pendulum has been swinging for a very long time towards the right wing, the conservative right wing, because we've had political Islam on the rise and we've had these so-called secular regimes fighting political Islam with a very conservative interpretation of Islam. So with both these conservatisms, we get stuck in the middle. So yes, it was the secular regime. It was the, basically the remnants of the Mubarak regime because that's how the Mubarak regime trained its police force. At the time, it was the, the security forces of, the, of SCAF, the, the military junta. I call them the 19 Mubaraks who took over from Mubarak because we've just been replacing Mubarak with another Mubarak. And, and you know the irony of that attack is that I, I was detained for six hours by in the interior ministry and six hours by military intelligence, again headed at the time by Sisi. When I was in the interior ministry, I insisted on telling all the men in the room, because it was just men, obviously, that I had been sexually assaulted. One of them said, oh, it must have been crowded. I said, actually, no, it was just me, surrounded by four riot police. And then the big boss, he said to me, because he thought he was going to play the class argument, because obviously, class has a lot to do with what's happening in our region. And he said to me, you know these men who did this to you? You, you know who they are. And he's talking about the central security forces in Egypt who are um, conscripts, who are the least educated and the poorest in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And this big boss in a you know, fancy suit, he says to me, those men who did this to you, they're the scum of society. They are the lowest of the low. And we, being the regime, lifted them up and we scrubbed their brains clean until we opened the door this tiny. And he thought I was going to say, oh my God, those animals, because he thought, you know, I come from a rich upper class family, or whatever, and that I was going to play the class unity card with him. And he said this to me, and I said to him, who made them that? Who left them? living in the dregs of society, and you're surprised that we're having a revolution, and you just walked away. Mm -hmm. we, need to speak, we need to speak about a very important part of your book, because I know that a lot of, a lot of people, especially women, want to hear you explain some of the points you're making about the hijab and about the niqab. Mm -hmm. um, and the hijab is something that you, you're critical of, what do you say to the women who choose to wear a hijab? Would you, would you defend their right to choose to wear the hijab? 
Okay, the, the way that I talk about hijab now, which is the headscarf, many of you might know, but I will explain it anyway. It's a, hijab is a form of dress that involves covering your hair and most often clothing that covers everything except for your face and your hands. Now, I chose, and I use this word chose, I chose to wear a headscarf or hijab when I was 16. And I took it off when I was 25, but I spent eight years, eight of those nine years, trying to take it off. So what I learned was it's much easier to choose to wear a headscarf than to choose to take it off. And so my question has been over the, the, the many years since I took off my hijab, why is it so much easier to wear it than to take it off? And, and one of the things that I talk about in my book and that I talk about in my talks like this is this idea of modesty culture. Because I already talked about purity culture when it comes to the Christian South and what the Christian Brotherhood has been doing in the United States. Now this idea of, of modesty culture and purity culture, they're all ways by which we control girls and women. And they unfairly burden girls and women. Men are not expected to be modest. Men are not expected to be pure. Men are not expected to cover all of their bodies in the way women are. And so my question becomes then, what kind of a choice is it? Is it if it only women are expected to make it? And what kind of equality are we really fighting for if it's modesty and purity that ends up unfair, unfairly burdening just girls and women? But what about women who choose, in, in, in North America, in Canada, women choose to wear hijab. It's actually more difficult to do that than not to because they, mm -hmm. a lot of them have told us they get harassed. Yes. So if they've chosen to do that, is that mm -hmm. not a choice? Is that mm -hmm. not... It, would you, as a feminist, defend their choice to wear hijab? I would not see it as a feminist move, because as I said, I think that modesty unfairly burdens girls and women, and I don't think that it is a, a feminist thing that, that demands a woman dresses in a certain way that a man is not also required to dress. But is so, your choice a feminist thing? Well, you see, here's the thing. As a woman, I no longer, perhaps in the past I used to, but I'm, I'm very, very specific about this. Just because a woman has chosen to do something, it doesn't mean that I have to support that choice. Just because she's a woman. Because women will sometimes make choices that are completely antithetical to my principles. For example, these women who go from the UK and the US to join Daesh, ISIS. Supposedly, they have chosen to go and join a gang of what I consider murderous shits. Men who systematically sexually abuse women. Now, they have chosen to go and join Daesh, but I do not respect that choice. My mother wears a headscarf, my sister wears a headscarf, most of my female relatives wear headscarves. But I have to, at the end of the day, and I know you're talking about North America, my sister wears a headscarf in, while she's studying for a PhD at Northwestern University, and her reason for wearing it is because she wants to be openly identifiable as a Muslim. I understand that. My mother wears it because she believes it's a religious obligation. I understand that. But again, this idea of choosing something that specifically burdens just girls and women, I understand it, but it doesn't mean that I have to support it as a feminist. That's where I make a distinction. I'm just gonna ask you one more question before I turn over the audience, and I think there are people there who will probably want to pursue that uh, question with you. But the last question I have for you is, again, a Canadian issue. It involves a woman named uh, Zunera Ishak. And Zunera Ishak is a woman mm -hmm. who wears a niqab mm -hmm. and uh, ch wants to wear a niqab to a citizenship ceremony. It's not yes. to do with league. She's sworn in, mm -hmm. uh, shows her face, but she's wanted to wear that. And she has become a symbol for the, the conservative government that's in power right now in mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. And our prime minister has said, why would Canadians, contrary to our values, embrace a practice at that time that is not transparent, that is not open, and frankly is rooted in a culture that is anti-women. Would you agree with our Prime Minister? I hate to agree with anything that Harper has said. I, I have to start this, okay? <laughs> From the beginning. <laughs> All right. Just so that we can be clear, okay? I also detest Sarkozy and all the right wing that have been pushing for the bans in niqab. But I also detest niqab and what niqab represents. And we have to, and I consider myself a leftist, I identify as an anarchist. We have to, as a left, as a global left, be able to come up with a conversation that fights both the misogyny that I believe is behind the face veil and the racism and the Islamophobia that I believe and know is behind people like Harper and Sarkozy. We have to create this position. Thank you. And what do you, what do you, say, what do you say to Zunera who says, Zunera Ishak who says that it is not, she's not hiding her identity as Prime Minister Stephen Harper said, it is her identity. Right, well, you know, I've, I've read uh, an opinion piece that she wrote either for the Toronto Star or the Globe and Mail, I can't remember which it was. And she made a very similar argument to why she wears her niqab that I used to make about my hijab. And that was, I want you to accept my intellect 
and not be distracted by my body. I used to make this argument for the longest time, and that's how I used to pass my hijab off as feminist. But I, I moved away from that thinking again because, because you know what? I am my breasts and I am my hips and I am my backside. I am all of that. I am a woman. And if you cannot accept my intellect, unless I somehow change the breasts and the hips and the legs and all of that, then there is something wrong with us as a society. And there clearly is something wrong with us as a society. So let's fight that. And in, instead of making women cover up so that we can be taken seriously, it's like telling women, don't get drunk, don't wear a miniskirt so that you don't get raped. How about we tell the boys and men, stop fucking assaulting us. Stop it. And that, I believe, is what is at the, that's what is at the heart of, again, I say it, modesty and purity culture. Because, you know, I know her situation here in Canada is quite different than mine in the Middle East and North Africa. But I'm particularly obsessed with the Middle East and North Africa right now because I live there. In Egypt, this seriously is an issue of personal safety. Because when you create this hierarchy of supposed modesty, at the end of the day, first of all, a man who wants to sexually assault you assaults you regardless of what you're wearing. But when, what ends up happening is these women who are covered from head to toe are considered the good, pure women. And then a few rungs down the ladder are the women in headscarves who are good, but you know, not as pure as the ones completely covered up. And at the bottom of this hierarchy are women like me. And we all deserve safety on the streets, regardless of what we're wearing. And opinion surveys have consistently shown in Egypt and other parts of the Middle East and North Africa that regardless of what you wear, you, will, you, you face assault and street sexual harassment. So women end up feeling they have to hide and cover themselves in order to be safe. And the conversation is focusing on the wrong thing. We have to start focusing on our boys and men and demanding that they respect us. microphone there and uh, I ask you to uh, if you're coming to the microphone please ask questions oh please come to the microphone sir and please ask a, keep it I'm to, here. To questions please <laughs> and not uh, no speeches thank you sorry so thank you Mona for coming uh, the question is and again it's the same context it's, it's the Canadian context of what we're looking at right uh, and this is an argument I have with a lot of people I, I detest the, the oppression that a woman that is veiled or forced to wear the veil is suffering but also, I find that this is a hard, like in North America, uh, women who choose to wear the veil or the hijab are between a rock and a hard place. Yes. And also, the angle that a book like yours may bring to a North American is not an angle, probably, is not going to be used as an angle to help. I have never seen anybody criticizing Saudi Arabia for women's rights who actually wants to help Saudis. I've never seen anybody who criticized Middle Eastern countries for women's rights who actually wants to help the women. Mm -hmm. They use that criticism for their own agenda. Question, how can for, you, for how, how, yeah, okay. so that's my, my, my point is, how can somebody like you communicate to us in the West in general? How can we help and being, be less judgmental and be more helpful? Okay, thank you, thank you for your question. Um, are you Egyptian? Yes. Okay, good, because I'm counting the Egyptian men who come to my events. I'm keeping a tally. Okay, show of hands, Egyptian men. Where are the Egyptian men? I, I won't Egyptian inhale men. you, don't okay, worry. Who's for the men? I know there's one over here. He's, he talked me earlier. Okay, good. Because Egyptian I had... women. Oh, all right, yeah. all right. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, it was Egyptian men because I had a big group of Egyptian men at a reading in Ottawa a few days ago. So I was just curious. <laughs> all right, so I will answer quickly before I get to, you, to your question. Um, when I'm asked, what can we do to help you? I say absolutely nothing. We are going to help ourselves. I'm not asking for anyone to come and rescue us or save us, but there are two answers to your question. You as um, a, a citizen of Canada, I think the, the best way that you can help us is to help the, the cause of feminism generally. And there are many issues that women suffer from here in Canada because of misogyny, whether it's Aboriginal women, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's street sex sexual violence generally. Fight that, because whenever anyone in any part of the world sees the, the cause of feminism being lifted, it helps women across the world. But here's what the administrations can do. Ask the Harper government why they sell billions of dollars of weapons to a country that practices gender apartheid. Hold your politicians accountable. When the Swedish foreign minister tried to practice what she calls a feminist foreign policy against Saudi Arabia, she was, she was prevented from speaking to the Arab League by the Saudis. The ambassadors were withdrawn from Sweden by Saudi Arabia, UAE, 
um, and Kuwait, and the business community, to their shame, in Sweden, feminist Sweden, were upset with her because they were going to lose billions of euros or kronbergs or whatever they call them, their currency in Sweden, selling weapons to the Saudis. This is a crime. When, when administrations sit down with the Saudis, they are selling them weapons, they're making bi billions of dollars of business deals and buying oil. They never sit down and ask them, why are you treating women like this? The country of South Africa was uh, faced boycotts and sanctions because it practiced racial apartheid. Saudi Arabia practices an apartheid against half of its society called gender apartheid. Never, never do you hear anyone holding them accountable. And you have feminists in Saudi Arabia who are saying, listen to us, watch what we're doing. We're trying to break the driving ban. We're trying to break the guardianship system. Who is listening to them? Now, we hear each other as feminists in the region, but hold your politicians accountable, because if the politicians sat down with, with, with the regime of a country that, say, there was a black ethnic minority and they treated them terribly, or half the society was black and they were prevented from full rights, would your administration be dealing with them? I'm sure not. But when it comes to women, we're thrown under the bus. All right, speaking of women, there's one right there who wants to ask you a question. First, I, will, I would like to say that it's not fair to have only half an hour of questions with Mona, because she's very provocative. <laughs> My first question to you is, um, uh, you are asking, you are calling to have a sexual revolution in the, in the Middle East, while your book is extremely provocative in a for a conservative society. So as if you're doing a cultural shock, do you think people will not listen to you in a very conservative society and a society that's get, getting even more conservative now with, polar, with this polarization? So who does your, uh, uh, who do you target with your book? Who's my that's audience? My yes, okay. who's your audience? Mm -hmm. oh, my, gonna, I'm sorry, we're going to have to, because you look okay. behind you, there's a lot of people, so I just <laughs> have right. to combine it. I'm okay. sorry, no I'm so sorry. But Mona's staying afterwards till like till t tomorrow morning. Till forever. <laughs> and so <laughs> she has a bed back here, it's all good, so you can talk to her all night. <laughs> Carol. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, very quickly, there is an audience for this. I think that people outside the region tend to, tend to make the region monolithic. They tend to think that, it, that conservatism is in our DNA. They refuse to give us the, the choice and the diversity of opinion and life experiences that everybody across the world has. Now, I did say the pendulum has been swinging to the right, more conservative, but the pendulum can swing in the other direction, and it has begun to swing in the other direction. The, the people that you saw going out on the streets in Tahrir, for the longest time that we didn't have street protests, in, 19, in 2005, when I, was, I went back to Egypt to join protests, we were 150 in Tahrir Square, 150. And then when it was time to rise up against Mubarak, it reached the hundreds of thousands. So, you know, the people there are not monolithic. They represent different points of views. But my specific audience is those young people who, who demand the freedom and dignity in their own personal lives. The week before I came out on my book tour, I was invited to speak at a TEDx event at a university in a town called Zagazig. This is a conservative town northeast of Cairo. I was invited to speak by a 19-year-old pharmacy student, a man, who wrote to me and said, Mona, please come and speak at our TEDx because we need a feminist like you to shake our community. This is a young Egyptian man in a conservative provincial town that was the birthplace of Mohammed Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood president. And so if I am invited to go and speak so I can shake up the community in a town like Zagazig, that tells me that there are young men and women who are challenging that conservatism. We are not conservative automatons, you know, just walking around following the orders of either the regime or the Muslim Brotherhood. People truly want lives in which they make their own decisions. And that's who I hope my audience is. And when it comes to shock therapy, you need to shock people sometimes. As I said, I reject this idea of being polite and respectable. These are things we need to talk about. Okay, gentlemen here. Uh, good evening. Yes, uh, I was struck by the, uh, the uh, percentage you said it was 90% of uh, FGM. I, I will uh, wonder whether this just to say F FGM is female genital mutilation. Just uh, people who don't know thank that. Thank you, Carol, because mm -hmm. I, I wonder if, it ha if GM happens for boys and, and men at all. If it does, I don't know if it's mutilation. But is it simply a question that we're threatened by you, so we have to do this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons that, that yeah, there's undoubtedly, you know, this is why, why do men control women in any part of the world, not just where I come from? I think it, it's scared, they, they, they fear women, they fear the temptation of women, they need women, they hate the fact that they need women. It's, this, is, this is something that is deep-rooted and is global. It's not, again, specific to the DNA of men of where I come from. Mm. And it's something that feminism has been fighting. Um, the genital cutting that I'm talking about is that that removes either part of the clitoris, the whole clitoris, or removes the, or, or involves the most extreme version, which removes many parts of the external genitalia and then sews it up. 
the kind of circumcision, and I make a distinction between either genital mutilation or genital cutting, that happens to boys removes the foreskin. That is very, very different than removing or partially removing the clitoris. The clitoris is the only part of the body that is solely for pleasure. Nothing else. It, it serves no other purpose. That's why I say FGM is to control female sexuality. Thank you. Uh, gentleman here. Hi, Bona. Hello. Uh, I, uh, first of all, I commend your courage for breaking a taboo about sex in Egypt because yeah, that's a big taboo in, in the whole area. Yes. Um, <clears throat> my difference with you, in, in, I read your book and uh, you were quoting some of the feminists like uh, Fatima Mersini and <clears throat> Laila Ahmed. You are trying to, uh, to challenge the, the, the hijab from within and I personally, I don't, I don't think that will work. Okay, you will end up sooner or later, you know, clashing with the culture, with religion. That's my opinion. Thank you. And I okay. want to see it. All right. Uh, do you want me to respond, or that was just a comment? No, no, I want to I'd like to hear you respond. To okay. That. So, so wait, if, if I can... So basically, your conclusion is that I'm, I must leave Islam, or I must make the argument outside of Islam? I'm not sure. Yeah. I, no, I thought this... this my opinion, to, the argument should be outside of Islam, same like Nawal al-Sadawi did, like in a medical way, in a scientific way, not... not within the religion because uh, they have lots of battery of uh, hadith yes. and you will never end up with it. Okay, okay. well I think, what, I think what I do is a combination because I don't call, I, I belong to a movement called Musawa and, and that is the Arabic word as you, you know I'm sure but for the, for the purpose of everybody else here it means equality in Arabic and Musawa is a global movement of equality and justice in the Muslim family it was launched in Malaysia in 2009 and it has activists and writers and scholars from all over the world. And I belong to this movement as a Muslim and as a feminist. I don't call myself a Muslim feminist because I don't use the, my verse versus your verse. But there are, there are women and scholars in that movement who are personal mentors of mine, like Amina Wadud, who led us in that f Friday prayer in 2005 in New York. It was the first public mixed gender Friday prayer in which a woman led men and women praying side by side in New York for Friday prayer. Now, I joined that Friday prayer and I stood next to a man and I prayed without my headscarf and on my period, which for a lot of people is a huge taboo. But that was my way of celebrating the fact that we had a woman imam for Friday prayer. So a lot of what I do is not following my verse versus your verse, but I need to use the, 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 the Muslim feminist argument because there, before we had that prayer, a lot of people wrote to us, the, the group organizing this prayer, and said, I need you to give me the religious justification for why this prayer is okay. I went to pray behind Amina Wudud because I personally believe it is the right of a woman to lead prayer. But other people who came to the prayer needed a verse or a hadith to say that it was okay. There are many people in the region who feel that way and, it, and they need that religious argument from within. I try to, in my book, I bring some of that religious argument from within, which is why I use the work of women like Fatima Manisi, like you said, and Layla Ahmed. But I also quote Nawaz Sadawi because I also believe that there is a, a, set, a need for a secular argument from without. And I think the combination of the two is the most powerful. Thank you. Thank You're welcome. You. Uh, we, I think I've been told we have time for only two more questions. So, um, How about we take all the questions and I try to summarize? Why don't we do that? That's a very good idea. Um, th sh this actually works. I know it, doesn't, it seems hard to believe. But if, you, if we take th the next three people, give us uh, your questions, and usually we find there's common themes, all right? Fine. Um, I'm Armenian, Egyptian, Canadian, and my concern is more about the women who live in Egypt without the social support, like, you know, if someone, if a woman wants to leave her home because she's mistreated by the spouse, in the absence of the monetary support, the jobs, how can they ever even come close to any form of equality? And that's my concern. It's not the audience that you come to address because I appreciate what you're saying and I'm a Thank firm you. believer of everything you say. Thank you. And that's my concern. All right, okay. and we'll just take the next one after. Okay. Can you tell us your question, please? Hi, Mona. Hi. Um, actually, I have a question about debating with the scarves and people. Um, I always re rejected the idea of headscarf and in my endless debate with people, um, I always say that men should oppose for headscarves because it says a lot about them, not about us. And they reply back to me saying that, you know that men, they get stimulated visually, and not like women. And this is where I, I stop and I'm like, in my head, you're, I wanna, you know, 
say you were stupid idiot, stuff like that. <laughs> Just but tell like, him it's a bullshit argument. <laughs> exactly. So um, I, I wonder what would be your answer to that. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank and then you. Uh, this woman behind you, please. Hi there. Um, I'm actually a Palestinian Canadian, and um, well, I, I'm pretty sure everybody knows about the Palestine-Israel situation, and um, it's a big part of identity. Um, so for me, one of uh, the things that I try to impose is that to fix the problems of the Middle East, but at the same time not lose our identity and to bring that forward because that's what's being lost by the media. And so I'm asking you is like, how do we fight these issues, but still keep our identity intact? And if anything, try to, to show it off to the world rather than make it that our identity is our problems. Right. Thank you. I'm going to con continue on and get the other two people because there's just two left and we'll hear from all of you. Um, thank you for giving my three-year-old feminist a high five when you came in. Ah, I love your girl. She's adorable. Thank you. <laughs> my question is very simple. What role did your father play in your upbringing? Thank okay. you very much for that. <laughs> and last one. Okay. Um, I have a quick one. First of all, I really admire your guts. Thank you for coming. And secondly, I'm just curious what keeps you in Egypt instead of maybe living out here. Okay. <laughs> Thank Where you. Want you. Oh, actually, okay. that is the quick, that's the easiest answer, I mean, the easiest question to answer, so I will, I will work backwards. Okay. Um, because, you know, it's too easy to be a feminist in New York. It's really easy. I, there's, there's nothing to be done, you know? I mean, well, there is, obviously. I mean, I say every community has problems. I probably ha would, would have, you know, more of a challenge to be uh, in Oklahoma than in New York. But I couldn't write a book like this from New York. It's too easy. I can't write a book like this by remote control. But more importantly, I went back for many reasons. I vowed if Mohammed Morsi became president, I would go back and fight the Muslim Brotherhood in the way that I've always fought the Mubarak regime. Because I detest military rule and I detest political Islamic rule. We want to be free of both in Egypt. So it was to go back and fight political Islam and then military rule came back, so now I'm fighting military rule, along with many other Egyptians, not just me, obviously. But also because the real feminist fight now is in the Middle East and North Africa. What we're doing now happened in a much more vital way here, you know, by your grandmother and your, your maybe great-great-grandmother in order to give you whatever privileges you have now. So I f I'm very lucky, regardless of what happened to me, and I feel that if a person has privilege of any kind, they're obliged to fight 10 times harder. So for me, I have to be at home, and that's Cairo. So that's your question. The feminist. Okay, so I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll, I'll remind you of each of them, and then you have to wrap it up pretty quickly oh, because you. I'm getting these okay. signals. The Armenian so, woman who asked me, "How do we help women if they need to escape their how, families?" Okay, and yes, because they need social support. How yes. can they have equality? Mm. The father who wants yes. to know what his role should be. Uh, the bullshit argument. Yes. And uh, <laughs> that's it. And I how think. do we keep the fight up? Keep the, keep fight to fight the issues and keep our identities. All the identities, right, okay. So the, the question about how do we help women with social services is a really vital one. And whenever, I, you know, every week, no exaggeration, I get emails from people saying, I know this nine-year-old girl who's about to be cut. Her mother does not want her to be cut, but her father insists, how do we get her out? I know a 19-year-old girl who's in Port Said who wants to take off her hijab and wants to leave home, but her family won't let her. Every week, I know an American citizen who's stuck in Tartus in Syria, and all we need to do is get her to the, to the US embassy. Every week. You, I don't know if you've all heard of Harriet Tubman, of the, the Underground Railroad for Slavery. This is what we need to create. We need to create, honestly, in all seriousness, an Underground Railroad that ends up creating a fund that helps women to leave abusive situations if they need to, that helps women get jobs, that gives them internships, that if someone has an empty room in their apartment says, come live here. Now, some countries in the region have shelters, but not all of them. Most countries don't have laws against domestic violence. So we need to, to pull our money together, pull our resources together, pull our job opportunities together, and start saving each other. Because I've maintained all along, no one can save us. We can only save ourselves. So we need to start up some kind of underground railroad and a fund that girls and women can tap into if they need help. That's a very quick answer. And that's obviously going to take a long time, but we have to start somewhere. Um, the, the feminist father, I don't know where you are in the audience. Oh, there you are. Thank you for coming with your family, and thank you for coming with your daughter, because you have a tremendous role to play in, in your, your daughter's life. Any woman I know who has achieved anything in her life, it's because she's had a mother who is strong and is a role model, and a father who did not get in her way. 
And I know that you won't get in her way. And I know that you will encourage her because you brought her here. So you have a tremendous role. One of the things I like to say over and over again is, we've removed Mubarak from the presidential palace, but we need to remove Mubarak from the bedroom and from our minds. And that is the patriarchal father who gets in the way. So basically, you know, nourish and love your daughter and bring her up as a feminist. And I will be forever grateful. <laughs> and I know you will, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So thank you. And to your wife. Um, the, the, the bullshit argument. It, it is so totally bullshit to say that men are visual creatures. Do I not have eyes? Do I not have desire? I was just talking with Lauren, my publicist, about hot soccer players. For goodness sake, okay? <laughs> I have a thing for men with beards and tattoos, okay? Am I gonna go around now and tell men with beards and tattoos, excuse me, you're really tempting me because I'm a very visual character. Do something. <laughs> no, I'm going to say, <laughs> so just seriously, this, this is not right. This, this is basic human biology, come on now. It, 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 I'm, I'm joking and making light of a serious issue. Men and women have desire. And sometimes a woman's sex, sex drive is higher than a man's sex drive. This is science, okay? So there's not men need, because this is one of the reasons actually that the Saudis, this is amazing. The Saudis went before the Commission on Human Rights to talk about the convention of, of the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. It was the annual report. They went all the way to Geneva to, to talk about Saudi Arabia. It was a man, of course, representing Saudi Arabia. And when they were asked why they allow polygamy, the Saudi male said with a straight face, because when a man has a sex drive that one wife cannot satisfy, he deserves more. In Geneva. And that's why I say that some women have higher sex drives than men. So we need to just rubbish these pseudo-biological arguments, quote-unquote, that say that men are visual creatures. They are not. That's what I'm going to say. All right. Uh, you know, we're oh, no, no, the, 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 the identity question oh, yes, that the Palestinian-Canadian woman said. I think it's a question of who determined what I, our identity is and what you've determined your identity is. What about your identity do you find important? And what do you find that you've had the, the biggest stake in creating? Because I, I, don't think, I, I don't think I'm problematizing our identity. What I'm trying to say is, there are problems in the kinds of culture that we are told to respect, and it's a culture that I had no hand in, in deciding. And, and sometimes there are identities that we had no hand in deciding. So for you as a Palestinian, I'm sorry, I don't know where you're sitting, but for, are they your, hello, thank you. Um, you decide what is important for you in being Palestinian, and you portray that to the world in the way that makes you the most proud. I, just a few things, uh, of, of some thank yous and just uh, some information. Mona is going to be signing books outside, and uh, she's not signing the night, that was a lie. I um, want to thank <laughs> the police officers who have been here and just been so attentive and patient, and thank you for being here and for your contribution. I want to thank all of you for coming out because this was a very, very good audience. I just, I, I, I learned a lot from you. I heard some good things and I heard from the wonderful Mona El Tahawi. And I think that I want to give the final huge round of applause to this woman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.